and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where DC has all the same old problems still. Shazam, Shazam 2 is not that bad. I actually think it's a good movie, as, well, its cinema score, to be fair, is a little low. But anyway, uh, the D DC's old problems are now spreading to all comic book franchises. Yikes, it's like what they say in Avatar. It's not your problem now, but it will be soon, and we're it soon. So yes, Shazam came in under its already very low projections. They were projecting 35, and it couldn't even make that. It came instead at 30.5, 30.5, ah, oh, that stupid decimal, almost half of the original film's debut back in 2019. Why? Oh, for so many reasons. You ready? One. James Gunn can complain all he wants about Warner Brothers Discovery asking him to spin crap into gold. And by the way, he made some of that crap. Uh, but bottom line, when he decided to soft reboot DC, he left all these movies in the shade. I'll say it. I'll, say, I'll keep saying it. I told you the Snyder Cut would haunt DC, right? I told you that when that just when Justice League came out. Some of you have clipped my my. Uh, I think it was either my review or spoiler review, and I said that it would haunt Warner Brothers. That it would never go away. The Snyder Cut, and uh, I'm telling you, this soft reboot was a mistake. Uh, so anyway. Uh, it's not so. It's not even a goodbye tour. If he was doing a hard reboot, they could be like, "Say goodbye to your favorite characters." Instead, nobody knows what's going on, including the people running the show. Because when Gunn and Saffron were on the red carpet for Shazam 2, they said, "Do you think you'll make a third one?" And they said, "Let's see how this one does. Maybe we will." What the heck? And by by the way, some of you might be like, "Well, I guess they're not making a third based on this opening weekend," but. You don't know for sure. Again, we don't know. Because what if Shazam 2 blows up on digital streaming? That's very possible. It's a family movie. Uh, will Warner Brothers Discovery, who's already been following Universal's playbook to a degree, decide to do the 17-day theatrical window? Shazam 2 is performing like Uni's little hit makers. And remember, Shazam movies are cheap to make comparatively speaking, when it comes to blockbusters. So that gives them more incentive to, you know, to continue maybe with the franchise. And then don't forget that there's that end credit sequence in Shazam! Fury of the Gods that hints that even if Zachary Levi's Shazam! doesn't get another of his own movies, it seems he might be sticking around in other characters' projects, because it helps to be vacation buddies with the boss. That's him and Peter Safran over the holiday season. But yeah, DC, even with new leadership, continues to have no clear direction. That's incredible. Other than favors for friends. And, I mean, speaking about not being definitive, they can't even definitively fire anyone over there. They're like, maybe they'll come back. You don't know. You're like, just throw down the gauntlet, man. Make some decisions. Uh, you know, although, you know, the don't revolve around, you know, James Gunn himself. All right, so anyway, two. Shazam 2 is even more of a family film than the last entry. And while being primarily a family film limits your audience. Uh, Shazam 2 was down about 10% in the 18 to 34 demographic. The name of the game with comic book movies is to appeal to as many groups as possible. But the 18 to 34 demographic, and to be fair, families are the ones that really do heavy lifting when it comes to these big blockbusters. That's who you need to come out to get those big numbers. Uh, three, the comic book movie marketplace is simply oversaturated. And what's worse, the quality is dropping, and it's dropping fast. Audiences feel burned and are a lot more reluctant now to dole out the cash for a trip to the multiplex when they know the odds are the movie's probably not even going to be that good. It used to be these movies were surefire. It was fun. You were involved. You were invested. But then also because also the streaming services have added a new dimension with the shows that now you have to watch as well, I think people feel that they're even behind. They're like, oh, I guess, you know, I told you. Again, we talked about this. Don't let people feel they can miss a chapter because once they do, they feel they can miss other chapters. It's the whole problem that DC also has is that every chapter isn't connected. So it's an a la carte menu over there. Uh, but, you know, Marvel, of course, they were very smart to make it a, uh, <laughs> a um, you know, uh, a fixed a fix price meal, but they just have too many courses now. And people are like, I can't eat anymore. Uh, <laughs> I love a good metaphor. All right, so anyway, uh, what's more uh, is that now audiences also know the film will hit digital and streaming sooner or later. Pro 
probably sooner. Look at the snapshot poll I took on Twitter yesterday. Just 29% of you, a scooch less than a third, plan to see Shazam 2 in theaters. I know this is, isn't scientific, but it gives you, as I said, a snapshot look at the, what's going on here. Uh, only 9% of you are excited and waiting for the gunverse to start. But you know what? You don't know what it's going to be. So how can you be excited about something you don't know what it's going to be yet? And then the rest of you are evenly sp split between waiting for digital or HBO Max, there it is, or having had enough of all the DC drama. With the new heads so far continuing that drama. They're not squashing it at all. They're, in fact, in some ways, I think, blowing it up. I mean, this past week, as we discussed on the live stream on Friday, was insane. It was like Andy Cohen couldn't believe it. He was like, is this my show? Uh, all right, with the, with the theatrical window shortened by the pandemic and getting audiences used to that, uh, so they have to, you know, studios still kind of have to, to, I think that's not going to go away. But basically, studios are still like, well, how can we still try and make some money out of this? Because as Bob Iger recently revealed, Bob Iger started all this. Bob Iger's like, my bad. He said streaming so far isn't as profitable as traditional distribution methods, which is theatrical and on digital. And, you know, remember back in the day, DVDs? Still to this day, VHS and DVDs, still to this day, the most profitable the thing that ever happened to the movie business. And it was killed by streaming, and they have not, they thought that streaming services would replace it, but so far, not yet. Because, you know, it's not that expensive to put out a DVD, but it's very expensive to make this content, which is specific for streaming services. Netflix is also suffering a little bit, but they're not as diversified as these other studios. That's why they're running into troubles. They have a lot of different business, parts of their business, whereas Netflix is just a streaming service. All right, so anyway, every studio but Disney now releases their films for digital purchase or rental at top dollar, around 25, 20 to $25 rental or purchase only. And then they wait months sometimes before putting the film on their streaming service or somebody else's if they don't have one. Like Sony still doesn't have a streaming service, so theirs is uh, Netflix. It goes to Netflix for them. But even Disney is testing this strategy with Avatar 2, which will not debut on Disney Plus when it hits digital March 28th. Sure, that's a ploy to keep it off of HBO Max, thanks to the, uh, r the remains of the Fox deal, the deal that Fox had. But if Disney sees this being very profitable, profitable they might be like, whew, let's keep doing it. Uh, Bob Iger really needs money. It was just announced. He's, he just asked everybody to come up with lists of who to fire as he tries to free up $5.5 billion. Everybody, you know, streaming services, streaming services are expensive. All right, four, lack of star power. I'm going there. I'm going there. All right, so the first Shazam was held up kind of by Zachary Levi and Mark Strong. Hey, Mark Strong looked cool in the coat. What a great pop collar. And the shades, he looked awesome. And also audiences always get excited to meet a new character, a new comic book character, most of the time. It doesn't always work, but to some degree, you know, audiences are very hopeful. Uh, but Levi might have done some real damage to his star power, you know, call it, you know, to a degree. I don't know if he was ever really a star, but, you know, I think he whittled down what he had with some of his recent online comments, including an anti-vax tweet, which did not sit well with a lot of you. I mean, it sat well with some people, but it seems those people either didn't go to the, bo either you didn't go to theaters or you're a small group. Uh, some fans exclaimed, in fact, uh, that Zachary Levi might actually be who so many accuse Chris Pratt of being. That was one of my favorite comments I saw off of that. I was like, Chris Pratt's uh, management team should run with that. They should be like, oh, look at that, a glimmer of hope. I'm sure it also didn't help that uh, Zachary Levi so aggressively backed Gunn and Saffron. Like, he was foaming at the mouth. You remember that. He was like, guys, just give him a chance. Now, I think on the one hand, people were, you know, like, well, we don't, you know, don't tell us what to, nobody likes to be told what to do. We'll talk about Tom Cruise in a minute. Uh, but anyway, I think DC fans were like, whoa, we're skeptical, if not downright angry about this new leadership. And then also, of course, everyone was like, you're just doing that because you're their friend and you're trying to save your job, man. You know, that's not legit. You know, we, we, we know uh, what, it, you know, we know simping when we see it, right? Uh, and especially, I think people are particularly upset. That's why the soft reboot is a problem, because they're not—they're getting rid of all the fan favorites, and the people they're keeping, for the most part, are, is not anyone that anyone was rallying for. They're like, so wait a minute, the one that everybody loves has to go, but your friend gets to stay. That's like the main reason I think that the soft reboot isn't going to work. Outside of Zachary Levi, this is Rachel Zegler's second giant flop. 
Where are her legion of social media fans? That's the whole reason that Hollywood hired her. They were like, wow, look how popular she is online. Surely all these people will buy a ticket. Well, they ain't. They ain't buying tickets at all. Uh, I'd be a little bit nervous about Snow White at this point because you got Rachel Zegler and Gal Gadot. Oh my God, that's starting to look pretty darn bad. They're actually both in this movie. Uh, and I don't think anybody watched Shazam 2 and was like, wow, can we get those two in a movie together? Uh, but you are getting it. Uh, and Helen Mirren and Lucy Liu. Helen Mirren was fantastic in this movie, but clearly they aren't the type of talent to excite fanboys. Sure, Helen Mirren is in the Fast and Furious movies, but she has a very small role there. She's not the one responsible for selling tickets. She's responsible for giving Vin Diesel some acting credibility. As I said before, it's funny. They have a ton of female Oscar winners in the Fast and Furious movies standing next to all these guys who, you know, can argue, arguably can act. <laughs> I'm trying to be polite. All right. It's fun. One of my friends pointed that out to me. I thought it was hilarious. Also, as talented as Jack Dylan Grazer is, I'm sorry, Jack, uh, and he's very personable. I love the kid, but he might be one of those great actors that just can't sell tickets. There's a real possibility. Also, he's still a teenager. He's still figuring out who he is. And I would, you know, I think that I would take that opportunity to maybe switch it up because the direction he's heading in now isn't working. So he, you know, for instance, I maybe wouldn't go with his uncle's famous hairstyle, right? Or infamous hairstyle. I'd be like, you know what? Maybe that's not for you, buddy. I think he should, I think his team maybe, maybe should hire a stylist to help him with his look on and off camera. I'd be like, I think it's time. You know, I think he's still in a good place. I think everybody who did see the movie was like, he was great in it. I think he's a really, really talented, personable actor, but something's not working. So before he just cements it, he should see if he can fix it. Uh, and then finally, five, the fifth reason, critics and the media overall have turned on superhero movies, joining the rest of Hollywood. Even Angela Bassett got snubbed for her Oscar because a lot of voters said they just couldn't bring themselves to vote for a comic book movie, but just gave one to Joaquin Phoenix recently, so I think they're pretty clear about what type of comic book movie. Uh, Quantumania did even more damage than suspected. But Shazam 2, as I said, is way better than 53%. I don't think the movie deserves to be rotten. Does it deserve to be low on the, on the fresh scale? Maybe it does. Because the first movie got an A cinema score, and the second got a B plus, which, to be honest, is the lowest cinema score a movie can get before a studio should freak out. Uh, anything lower than a B plus, unless your horror movie is like, uh-oh. And even B plus is like, ah, we messed up a little bit. So yeah, that's disappointing. I would have preferred an A minus. So that's not, that's, that's not good. And again, cinema score is very accurate when it comes to how the audience really feels. Whereas fans, as I've said before, can manipulate something like a Rotten Tomato score. Uh, and once audiences are burned out, well, there's blood in the water for critics and the media. Whereas a lot of, well, in the past, non-DC movies have gotten a pass, right? Uh, I don't think that's going to be the case anymore, again, with all this blood in the water. And also a feeling of, as these movies genuinely do get worse, and the people running the franchises get sloppy, and I think rest on their laurels, I feel we have uh, a real breaking bad, bad moment of, they just can't keep getting, getting away with it. So I think that's, an, I mean, that's one of the reasons I gave John Wick. I know some of you are so upset about that, but you haven't seen the movie. When you see John Wick 4, I think you'll understand why I was like, I'm sorry, but one good hour in a three-hour movie is not a fresh tomato, man. I don't care if that good hour is at the end. In some ways, that's even worse. Because, you know, if you want to go use the bathroom and get some snacks, I'm telling you, before he gets to Paris is the time to do it. So what the heck is Warner Brothers Discovery going to do? They've got three more of these this year, all coming out this year. Then a year and a half break before Gun Superman Legacy kicks off his new DC, and interestingly, and perhaps fittingly with him writing and directing, uh, July, 20, July 11th, 2025. You know, he's like, it's not the gun verse, but he's kicking off where he's like front and center. What if all these remaining movies crash and burn? Warner Brothers Discovery is clearly worried about that with the odd move of having Tom Cruise, of all people, endorse The Flash on Friday, the day that Shazam 2 opens and two months before The Flash hits theaters. Why didn't Tom Cruise endorse Shazam 2? Maybe they showed him both movies and he's like, I'll maybe they showed Shazam 2. He's like, I'm not endorsing that, but come on, it was a good movie. Maybe Tom Cruise is like, I can't say that's the movie we need right now. So he decided to endorse The Flash. But I don't know, if he wasn't going to endorse Shazam 2, hold his endorsement till I don't know, closer to the release date of The Flash? I mean, who's even going to remember it at that point? 
And is Tom Cruise an influencer now? Is he adding that to his resume? Saying this is the kind of movie we need right now? Wasn't that his Top Gun Maverick and Avatar 2? How many movies do we need right now? Despite this being an obvious marketing ploy, and also if I were Paramount, by the way, Tom Cruise's current home, I'd be nervous that Zazie was trying to poach my star. Uh, Paramount doesn't have a ton of them. They have uh, John Krasinski and Ryan Reynolds also. But Tom Cruise is their crown jewel right now, and Zazie's after him. Remember, Zazie tried to poach Foggy. Couldn't get him. Now he's after Cruise. He's like, watch the Flash movie. I'd be like, Tom, look at the Flash drama, and look at the Flash ad campaign. Think of those things too, buddy. Uh, but I think it's insulting also to the general public that they would be swayed by what movies Tom Cruise likes. Who goes and looks at the marquee and says, you know, I wonder, what movie do you think Tom Cruise would buy a ticket for? Tom Cruise would do well to remember that he's in a cult and everyone, for some reason, has decided to give him a pass right now. Heck, I'm giving him a pass because I'm liking his movie so much. But he's right on the edge. Everyone could turn on him in a second. Jimmy Kimmel was already zinging him hard at the Oscars this year when Tom Cruise decided not to show, even though Top Gun Maverick had several nominations and won for Best Sound. Stay humble, Cruise. Don't spend all your capital on someone else's movie. It's not even your own studio's movie. What's he doing over there? I mean, you got to convince us to see Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, which comes out just a month after The Flash. What should Warner Brothers Discovery do, right? Honestly, the soft reboot, I don't think they're going to be able to recover. And it's too late. I mean, I guess it's not quite too late. They really sh It was a mistake. It's like the Snyder Cut all over again. And I honestly feel at this point the answer is just to let Comcast Universal buy this thing as soon as possible, which is 2024. That's the earliest they can start, sh start shopping around Warner Brothers. Uh, and just have Comcast cancel everything and then see if they can convince Matt Reeves to let them build a cinematic universe off of the Batman. Because that's the, that's the answer. That's the answer. It's very frustrating to see it right there and we can't do it. You're like, it's right there. And we're like, Matt Reeves said no. And you're like, Matt Reeves does not run DC or Warner Brothers Discovery. How is he able to say no? All right. So anyway, I guess he might quit, but I'd be, I'll play chicken with Matt Reeves. Do it, Stazzy. Play chicken with him. All right, I'd be like, what else are you going to do, man? Right? You're not making more Planet of the Apes movies. All right, as for the rest, I mean, somebody else is, but, you know, uh, yeah, the last one didn't even do that well. Uh, I mean, Matt Reeves, was a he had an amazing career turnaround with the Batman. All right, as for the rest of the top 10, just like last year, the latest Scream plummeted around 60% in just its second weekend. But it opened so big, it could still squeak past the century mark, which would be fantastic for the franchise. Again, hasn't been done since Scream 2. Uh, a new Scream every year might be a bit too ambitious and burn out the franchise, unless that's what Paramount, Paramount wants to do. Speaking of Paramount, make that money quick and then put the franchise back to sleep for another decade, which they've done twice before. I see a pattern emerging. I see a pattern emerging. So yeah, do Scream 7. I would definitely do Scream 7. Bring back Stu and then put it to sleep for a decade. You better get in there, Nev Campbell. You better get in there, unless you don't want to wait 10 years to get paid. Uh, things are, Hollywood's so nostalgia heavy, maybe it'll just be a five-year delay. But yeah, get in there, Nev. Creed 3 is doing great, right? Speaking of franchises, it's the biggest Creed movie yet, th just three weeks out, and so it's still climbing, and it hasn't even hit digital and streaming. 65, though, dropped big in its second weekend as well, meaning the real test for this film will be on digital, where CB is thriving, and yep, it's, a, it's going to finish around 60 million domestic in theaters, as I said last week. Not bad for an R-rated fringe comedy like this one. And Quantum Mania, it did manage to pass 200 million domestic, which means it beat out the first Ant-Man domestic, but globally, it's not going to top the first Ant-Man, which is really bad. Let's put it this way. Quantum Mania is such a flop, and I think the Mando numbers are so bad on Disney+. Plus. It hasn't hit Nielsen just yet, but rumors are it's bad. I think you can just see from the lack of conversation it's bad. That this week, this past week, Marvel reclassified all of its upcoming Dis Disney Plus series as coming soon. Whoo! Oh boy! Daddy Iger is surely not happy. And I have a feeling 2023, at least movie-wise, ain't gonna get much better. But Secret Invasion and Loki? I would think those would be able to rescue the brand. Ah, they're making me nervous with this delay. Do they need the reshoots? I haven't heard anything bad about both those shows, by the way. And they look phenomenal to me from what we've seen so far. So I would be really sad if they were not. And I would also question how that could happen. I'm like, those are like easy slam dunks, man. Although Kate Heron did leave Loki. Oh, so sad. And what's she even doing, man? What's she even doing? Come back, Kate. 
Over on streaming, The Last of Us slipped a bit from third to fourth place on the overall chart, and essentially it's fifth week. And it also fell below the thousand mark, you know, they do in the number of minutes there. But it held its number two spot on the acquired chart, so that's good. But it seems to have plateaued a bit, at least on HBO Max, at least on HBO Max. I know the day, the day and the day after numbers have gone up consistently through the show, but these we're looking at week-long numbers here, and it seems that it's plateaued a bit. It still has a couple of weeks to go, but it got a huge boost from Episode 3, as you might recall. And what we're looking at here should be a boost, again, from Episode 5, which was incredible. So it's weird. So we'll see. We'll see how this show continues to do. Maybe a bunch of people are waiting to binge it at this point. Uh, so anyway, you continue to dominate the overall and originals chart for the second week in a row. Well, The Woman King debuted on Netflix and did pretty good. Pretty good. At least it's uh, at least over on the movies chart, it's number two behind Reese Witherspoon and Ashton Kutcher's Valentine's Day movie for Netflix here in its second week. Over on the originals chart, Poker Face also fell, but it fell significantly. It dropped all the way down to seventh place. That's shocking. About halfway through its run. Remember, it started with four episodes, which means maybe 10 episodes was too much. Maybe it was a little too much, Poker Face. Uh, on Netflix's own charts, for just last week, Idris Elba got a nice win here with the recent Luther movie, right, which in th was in theaters for just a week. Solid numbers. It's not huge, but it's nice. Well, German rom-com Far Away, which actually happens to be mostly in English, is a mini-hit, mini-hit, with fans saying it's like Mamma Mia without the music. And before you say, who'd want to watch that, it's number two. And with series, you Season 4 Part 2 debuted and put the show back up, to, uh, back up top, although it's not huge. It, di it wasn't as big as Part 1. I don't think the split season here worked, particularly because the two parts were so close together. And while Chris Rock's com- this is interesting. While Chris Rock's comedy special might have trended something fierce when it aired live, remember live, Netflix's first live comedy special, I guess you didn't watch it. If you, if you didn't watch it live, you didn't watch it at all. Because there it is all the way down at number eight. Although, how often do we see comedy specials in the TV chart, right? The series chart. And it got me thinking. This is just basically one episode against so many other episodes for the series it's supposed to be competing with here. So isn't it really a movie? A very short movie. Yet, when you look at this, when you look at the numbers, if you were to put this on the movie chart, even at about an hour or so, it would be number three. So Netflix should treat comedy specials as movies, and they'd be getting a lot more of attention on these charts. And on iTunes, everyone is checking out Brendan Fraser's now Oscar-winning turn in The Whale. CB, which just debuted this week on digital, is number two. And good for Storm Reid, hot off of her The Last of Us episode, who's missing is holding steady in the top ten. Uh, see, she was in uh, A Wrinkle in Time, which was a huge bomb, huge bomb. Destroyed David DuVernay's career. 100 million plus flop. Uh, but Storm Reid didn't give up, and look how well she's doing. Good for her! Plus, fans are getting ready for John Wick Chapter 4, hitting theaters this weekend. Yes, as for this coming weekend, John Wick Chapter 4 has the weekend all to itself. Especially now that Shazam is DOA. Tracking for John Wick 4 has an opening with 60 to 70 million, which is incredible for an R-rated movie, a movie with a three-hour runtime, and it would set a new record for the franchise. Woo, that would be phenomenal. Uh, I, I, again, I feel bad being the party pooper, man. I feel bad. I feel bad. I'm going to see it again on a premium screen. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the third act. The rest, uh, maybe I'll feel better about it. Uh, but really, that's the only movie coming out this week, even on digital and streaming. It's a John Wick party, man. It's the only party in town, so that makes it even better. If you want a party, you got to go see John Wick. As for series, it's also very light this week. Netflix drops The Night Agent on Thursday, and then on Friday, Hulu has up there, up here, uh, a musical romantic comedy. Uh, we'll see if anybody watches that. All right, so anyway, if this week seems kind of quiet, that's because, well, first of all, remember, Mando and Ted Lasso are currently airing. But next Sunday, you know, Last of Us just wrapped, so this is a little calm, calm between storms, because next Sunday, Yellow Jackets returns on Showtime. That's a hot show. That's a hot show. And then the final season of Succession starts on HBO, HBO Max. Oh, HBO gives you one Sunday off. And then they're back in it, baby. And it's going to be great. It's going to be appointment television. So if you haven't watched the first three seasons, seasons of Succe first three seasons of Succession, you got a week. Uh, so yeah, if you got anything you need to catch up on, this is the week to do so. So that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you think of Shazam 2's box office? Can anything be done for DC, these remaining movies, and what's coming up? Share your thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.